Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the silver spot price in Japanese yen monthly chart. And I'm actually going to review all of the major currency silver charts based on the monthly because uh, we're seeing a transition now into positive territory. We're starting with the Japanese yen because that's actually the worst performing relative uh, to the MACD. And you can see that we're really still below 2008 highs, but uh, one would have to say, we'll just put the line uh, indicator on. One has to say, based on the chart, the long-term chart starting, really all of the bull markets in silver started in about 2003, 2004 in all the currencies. And you can see, uh, this is still a bull market. Now, it's not a phenomenal gain, nothing like somebody who bought Amazon in the dot-com era and held on to it. Uh, my, uh, just as an anecdote, my, my brother-in-law, who's a retired uh, like internet person who made a lot during the dot-com thing, actually invested a lot in those companies but pretty much concentrated in Amazon and what a brilliant move because um, that's one of the very, very few that did not uh, fail. Most, probably 90 something percent, I don't know what the percentage is of, of those companies that came out at that time. And some were actually really good ideas, but they were before their time. But uh, Amazon is one that performed so Congratulations to my sister and brother-in-law for piling into Amazon, continuing to pile into Amazon. But barring that type of performance that is kind of a really lucky call, uh, you don't see too many performances like this. The bottom of, uh, we're talking about a thousand uh, at the bottom of this uh, financial crisis, and, and now we're doubling up here to 2000. It's very clear from the chart that we're in a bull market. We're still in a bull market, but the MACD hasn't crossed. Now, the next closest one is the US silver spot. And you can see that's down here, uh, rapidly approaching the same line. Uh, and again, still below that 2008 high, which is absolutely ridiculous when we look at the monetary figures but it is uh, widening on the MACD. It's actually widening now to an extent that we've never seen only maybe this breakup or this uh, break to the upside in 2010. So crazy stuff. So let's get to the other currencies, the ones where we're actually seeing a crossover. So we'll start with uh, silver in Australian dollars and you can see here that the monthly now has a positive cross. You can see 0.41. We are crossed over into the positive monthly chart on the uh, silver Australian dollar uh, chart. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have that great of a time horizon. So that one doesn't give you a really good picture. The one that's really good is the silver spot Canadian dollar chart on the monthly. And you can see we have that penetration of the zero line here crossing on the MACD. And you can see also that we're moving. Well, unfortunately, we don't have that Bear Stearns thing as well. But you can see that we're definitely running in a bull phase. A slow one, a very steady one, but we're in that bull phase. Uh, I, I thought that one went out farther than it did, but uh, we're going to choose the euro next because the euro and Swiss franc are basically equivalents uh, ever since the Swiss decided to peg their currency to the euro. But uh, this is the euro chart, and you can see here we have this 0.06, so a positive cross on the first line as well. Clearly a bull market based on any type of long-term analysis. You can see that um, it's now shaping up to what it has been all along. Just a very, very long bull market. And 
last will be the British pound. The British pound has taken a significant hit since the Brexit vote. And you can see here again, 0.14 on the MACD. So a positive cross, a resumption of the bull market. Again, a very, very long-term bull market, but definitely a resumption of the bull market. So it's pretty clear that silver is entering it in my opinion silver is entering a new phase let's get to the tight range uh, us dollar silver chart and we'll do the 30 minute chart here so you can see the parabolic spike that i was talking about uh, that happened back when we got the brexit and the big run up there where we got above 21 dollars back on july 3rd you can see that we're consolidating it's it's not a a great pennant formation it's kind of a weird and sloppy one try to get to the best chart to to demonstrate that but it's it's forming into some kind of pennant and we'll draw in the trend lines here probably there and then We'll start from this one. So there and there. So the trend lines are holding barring these strange things here. Um, this spike up, we're starting to challenge that. And if we take that out, uh, then we're definitely on the move to that 26 price. Uh, moving out to the four hour, we wanna see how far the MACD has reset. So if we get out to the eight hour, you can see that the MACD is, is falling. But the, as the MACD is falling, the price is actually rising. So that's very bullish as well. And when we get out to the weekly, we can see that it's, although it's overbought on the daily, let's look at the daily here. You can see that on the daily chart, we're kind of overbought here. Uh, because you can see that we go back to all the way back to October of 2012 and we really only see one other overbought signal that rivals what we're looking at right now and that's this overbought signal that occurred back in uh, August of uh, 2013. So we're back up to that and based on that you would definitely want to say that we're, we're going to see a sharp correction. But you have to also look at the weekly and the monthly. Now clearly on the weekly chart here, you can see that if we are doing something like we did back in 2010, then there is a long ways to run because we're at 1.1 on the MACD and we ran all the way to 5.2 on the MACD the last time. And of course, again, back to the monthly, we haven't even crossed the zero line. So it's, it's hard to say whether or not we're going to see a series of dramatic moves like we saw during the last run-up. If we do see that, to get back up to that positive six, almost nearly seven MACD reading, that's going to be a significantly higher price. So uh, the, the price action right now is very strong. It's very encouraging to see us stay above the $20 price. I think uh, I pointed out before that some people are saying 2050 is a key pivot. Uh, I don't really put much stock in the pivot points, but you can see we're right now kind of approaching that area. This really looks to me to be a pennant. I think we're forming up another pennant and we're gonna try to reestablish a uh, parabolic move. So let's jump quickly over to the cryptocurrencies. Now, if you remember, I had covered them looking at the market cap. And for the longest time, the total market cap of all cryptocurrencies was hovering around nine to 10 billion. That was a figure that it just couldn't take out. And then with the latest move in Bitcoin and some other new currencies, cryptocurrencies, then you can see now we've jumped up to 
almost 13 billion. Now again, that's just a pittance, an absolute, just uh, less than a drop in the bucket. It's almost like a uh, a vapor of a drop in the bucket when you're talking about the capital flows that occur in the world, the amount of money that's in certain assets, and uh, we're going to look at uh, the performance of silver and the performance of gold for the year. But the performance for cryptocurrencies is absolutely phenomenal as well. The Basically, the cryptocurrencies have added roughly a third again to the market cap. And you can see I've ordered this in the order of market cap. You can see it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, um, Litecoin, the Dow, which is uh, a new coin. It's interesting to see it's over a hundred million dollars on this new coin. And uh, uh, NEM storage, Yo coin, I think that's a Chinese coin. I don't know, but it's around $60 million market cap. So they're all kind of growing together. That's very encouraging when you think about what is happening. Now, what is happening is that the finances of the Western powers are continuing to deteriorate, even with their ridiculously manipulated interest rates. And we're talking about, I think the latest figure I read from Zero Hedge was a total now of about $13 trillion in debt that is paying negative interest rates in the world right now. And it's just plain common sense that if you're invested in something that pays a negative interest rate, then you're no longer interested in the return of uh, the, the uh, rate of return on the asset. You're actually only interested in the uh, return in price, the, the capital appreciation of the asset, because there is no interest rate. So uh, we're funding our debt with zero or barely positive or nearly negative rates. And you can see the even at that incredibly cheap price of funding our debt, the debt is continuing to expand and it's, it's expanding in a scary way here. So this is the thing I always do with the debt to the penny. I don't trust the government figures. I don't trust the reported deficit. What I do is I take today's date, go back one year and look at how much we've increased. So you can see we were at 18 trillion 151 billion a year ago and right now we are at 19 trillion 362 so that's a big change from where we were before where we we stayed below that 1 trillion we're now this is over 1.2 trillion in yearly deficits so we're racking up 1.2 trillion dollars in debt per year uh, as uh, on a rolling average. Now, even more scary than that, I pointed out before how we have the shenanigans that our Congress has done with the debt cap. And uh, I'm not gonna review the whole thing here, but basically what they did was they stopped voting for a debt ceiling and decided to just set dates where they would have to deal with the issue and in between those dates where they would address the issue, they just allow an infinite cap. And you can see that now happening with the debt because as I pointed out in past episodes, we had the lock that we got starting in, it doesn't go back to March, but you can see this starts in, in July of 2015 and you can see the lock. Uh, it's clearly a statutory cap uh, or, or I, probably more accurately would be a reporting cap because I don't even know if these numbers are right. But there's a cap here because you can see 18,151 is a number that continues from this date, uh, the 10th of July of last year, all the way up to that fiscal end year period. And we get to 152, but it's the same. And then we get that blowout number. You see that right there? November 2nd, which is the first day of reportable 
uh, information in that month, we get that blowout from 18,152 to 18,492. So that's what happened last year. They kept the debt for many, many months, even extending back to, I believe, March. So we're talking about maybe seven months they kept this figure the same. Now this year, we are not looking at the same scenario. We're looking at a uh, kind of lock that we got basically starting again like we did that year in March where we got kind of a cap, 19,235. And you can see that holds, we get a 264, but you can see that it kind of bounces around that as an average, 19,200, 19,200. But you can see here that starting in right here in the 30th of June, we get a jump to 19,381. And you can see now we're rising back up to that price at a $1.2 trillion deficit. So the target date is actually going to be the end of October. That's the last time we had that fiscal squaring up and we're rising into that. So as I predicted before, it may be possible that we'll actually see a $2 trillion deficit uh, in existence by the time we get that congressional budget point in October. And of course, we know what that means. It means complete bankruptcy for the system, especially with them running almost negative rates and still unable to balance the budget by the tune of $1.2 to even $2 trillion. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they're going to confiscate your retirement accounts. And this is a article from Jeff Berwick. Uh, Signs the government is planning to confiscate your retirement accounts. Now, I haven't had any doubt about this for probably the last five to 10 years that they definitely intend to confiscate people's retirement. Now, they're not going to couch it in those terms. They're probably going to uh, combine things. That's how they're going to start out. They're going to uh, probably take, uh, well, if Hillary gets in, then who knows? Uh, it'll be more of the same as far as Obama's policies are concerned. Uh, if Trump gets in, that's kind of a wild card. We don't know what will happen. But if, if things continue as they are, then we'll get more of the same, which is what we saw in the Detroit bankruptcy and what we saw with the GM bankruptcy, where they just kind of nationalize things and take people's money. Uh, and we're, we're seeing that with Puerto Rico a little bit. So let's read this article. We've warned that bankrupt governments will be eyeing the multi-trillions of dollars in untaxed retirement funds when they get desperate enough. It is an incredibly common occurrence. It has happened in numerous countries in just recent memory. Poland, Hungary, and Bolivia are a few in the last years where retirement funds have been seized. Total funds currently held in private IRAs 401k accounts in the U.S. are estimated to be in the neighborhood of $10 trillion. That number looks awfully enticing to the U.S. government, which is currently indebted to the tune of $19 trillion and holding liabilities of over $100 trillion. As we dance on the brink of a massive collapse, the, government already, the government's already empty coffers will be even further decimated as the economy contracts massively and tax receipts plummet. In that moment, rather than reducing expenditures, and that's what you do, that's what anyone with a business does that is running into trouble, they reduce expenditures. Rather than doing that and doing massive layoffs and closure of departments like any regular business would do, politicians will nationalize retirement funds for the good of the country. And we continue to see movements in that direction. And he goes into SGT report. So you can read this article, excellent stuff from Jeff Berwick. Uh, I highly encourage you to follow his stuff. He is definitely a free market uh, Von Mises school person. 
everything he says about economics I agree with. I don't agree with him about um, raising your children, and I don't agree with him about uh, fighting the cops and stuff like that. But as far as economics, I definitely agree with him. So this stuff is coming very, very quickly, and we can see now that silver is starting to get some legs. Uh, it is already the best performing asset for the year. And it's taken it on the chin many years, but you can see this is the chart for this year. This is from Gold Core. Gold, silver, best performing assets in H1 2016, up 38% and 26%. And you can see right there, here is the chart. It is silver at the very top. That is the best performing asset of this year. And that's as of um, July 3rd. So it's actually doing a little bit better if we look at where it's improved since then. Um, I think if we pull up the daily here. Uh, either way, it's, it's very, very close. So uh, that's not something you're going to hear in the mainstream news. And as I've mentioned before, I personally exited both my pension and my 401k. I took an enormous hit uh, tax-wise, and that was a hit I was willing to take. I haven't made up that hit. I've made up a percentage of that hit in returns on assets that are outside of the system. But as far as assets are outside of the system, really you're, you're getting down to a very small amount. We're talking physical silver, physical gold, and if you can consider cryptocurrencies to be physical, than uh, physical cryptocurrencies and uh, everything else they have the right to take and they're probably going to make a move to take it because they can and we'll talk to you next time